Hello everyone and welcome to another StarCraft 2 replay. This one's going to take place on Arid Plateau. I'm the Red Terran Catrox, spawning in the top left hand position. In the bottom right we have a Zerg opponent by the name of Pills. And this is Master League Ladder Play. So, for this match I kind of want to show where I'm at with my Mass Raven build. I'm kind of, I tried the aggressive style that I've been doing for a long time. Uh, where I really try to get in and harass as soon as I get those ravens up and, and do as much damage as I can before their tier 3 tech and their giant economy kills me. And then I try the passive style where um, I use the ravens defensively and I'll do explosive expansions where I'll throw down like two planetary fortresses at the same time I move up marines at the same time I throw down auto turrets so I can you know take my third and take my fourth and take my fifth. And since I'm being defensive my raven numbers will will never dwindle because I'm not um, putting them to risk. Uh, so I can get gigantic Raven numbers, and we've seen that work really well. And then we've also seen the downside of that, where since I'm not putting any aggression on the Zerg opponents, he can get a gigantic economy, uh, he can get to tier 3, and those are two things that are really deadly to me. So, what I've been trying to do is take the best of both of these builds and, and, and work them together. And that's what we're going to see here. Uh, the key being, I think I have to be put on some sort of aggression. I just can't let the Zerg have a free free trek to Tier 3 and Giant Economy. Uh, throwing down my Engineering Bay block, put, put a few hit points on it, then I move in right around, um, what I'm at, say 100 hit point, 100 minerals, just to check his spawning pool timing. And the reason I move in at this time, say I got 200 minerals in the bank, uh, had I seen a quick pull here, what I can do is send out my SCV to take my command center. By the time it gets there, I'll be up to 300 minerals. And then I can cancel this engineering bay, and there's my 400 minerals. But I can see he was playing a 15 hatch, and he's just throwing down these two structures in response to game blocked. So I'm going to build my command center on 16 at home, and I'm going to try to get as many hit points on this engineering bay as I can. Little trick I do here, I'm not sure if it works well in this particular match. What you can do is when you get attacked, you take the SCV off, put it back on. Take the SCV off, put it back on. Yeah, it's not actually moving, unfortunately, so I have to flee. But what often happens is say you're getting attacked up here, you take the SCV off, you put it back on, and then the SCV travels down to this corner. So it's safe for a while. Maybe it screws up the AI of the drone, the drone stops it like trying to chase it. But basically the idea is to get as much hit points on this engineering bay as possible. Uh, without losing that SCV. That'll keep his lings here longer uh, as they want to clear that out and um, you know, it gives you a bit of an extra buffer. Uh, this Zerg opponent decided to take his third as his, or his natural third location as his second base um, so you just want to get a hatchery up somewhere. This can actually sometimes hurt me where the Zerg will do something stupid that'll end up being smart. And the stupid thing that they'll do is they'll take this base and they'll start saturating like they would any other like natural expansion. And then they'll kill this engineering bay and they're like, hmm, well, now I still have my natural expansion open. And it, that's like a good place to defend. And it's right between my first and my second base, so why don't I take that one too? And if I were doing anything aggressive, that would be suicide to take like three hatcheries in the first seven minutes. Um, but as it so happens, I'm not being aggressive, so it would work for them. So I'm kind of encouraging them to do something that will get them ahead economically. Um, that's what happens sometimes. Majority of the time, it encourages them to be aggressive versus me. It's like, hey, you went for 15 command center, and then I can't take my natural, so I'll just go kill him. And that's a more typical response, and that's the response I love. That's the one that gets me way ahead. So after you build your first marine, uh, just moving the barracks down, taking the bunker immediately, that's key. This bunker will be what saves you from a roach push. And um, can the supply depot up. So any roach push to hit me, say now, six minute mark, could be painful because I, I won't have this bunker done. Uh, but once it's done or pretty much close to done, then, uh, then I'm in good shape. And it looks like that's what's happening. It looks like there's four roaches in production and uh, four in the field. In the field, 
I'm just building more. Yeah, there's a bunch of roaches in the way here. Even bringing a drone for some reason. So what are we up to now? Eight roaches, five more in the way, so 13 roaches. Yeah, so he's putting a good amount into this roach push. But since I haven't seen any units, I'm going for my faint push to force out drones, or to force out stuff that isn't drones. I'm thinking he might be droning up right now. So I wanted to think that I could attack. But instead, I just run into this push. Uh, which is okay. I mean, at least it lets me know it's coming. And as long as I don't lose all his marines, I got someone to put back in my bunker. And you shouldn't ever lose the marines to roaches off of creep, because the marines are as fast or faster, right? I think they're the same speed. So he tries to come in, he can't. Obviously there's a fortress here, so he goes this way, and that's just, I don't know, just sitting in a bunker. But what he is going to do is exploit the one thing I hate about this map, and this is why I had this map thumbs down for a while. Um, obviously, if you see my videos, you know versus Terran and versus um, Zerg, I like to use a fortress in my natural expansion, but the fortress doesn't cover the natural expansion as well as it does on other maps here. And that thing can come up on the right and shut down this portion of my uh, mining. Which doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you're going mass ravens, losing one gas, I've just lost 25% of my economy, basically. Because I'm all about the gas. He's even able to come in from behind here, but you can do see I almost have high sec auto tracking done, so this little trick's not going to last for long. Now he's probably a little bit confused. He's like, okay, hey, I moved in. I just moved back to where I was, and I'm still getting hit. I was just safe here a second ago. What's going on? <laughs> and I'm you can see he's droning behind this. Uh, throwing down his lair. Yeah, so it's all about drones now. He's getting his metabolic boost. His upgrades, drones, expanding. Uh, taking this natural expansion now. And this is where I get a little sloppy just because I had never faced this from a Zerg opponent on this base. I've had Terran abuse this side on me, but never Roach, and I make some mistakes here. Uh, one is I'm one good thing I do is I queue up this planetary fortress to my main base. So yeah, I'm oversaturating this, but at least these SCVs are safe. But still, sometimes these SCVs like pop off and they want to mine from this patch and I just lose an SCV for no reason. Like right here, this one's going to pop off, come over here, and boom, I lose another SCV. So I'm losing like one here and there and it's just adding up. But then I throw it in this bunker here. It'll be useful later, but for now my idea is maybe I can slow push them back with bunkers and that can't work. And my final mistake is, you know, while I'm getting this uh, Corvid reactor, the energy upgrade for Ravens, I like to build one unit first, so my first Raven will pop with energy. And I always get the Viking to go Overlord hunting. But in this case, it should not have been a Viking. I should have built a Banshee. Uh, bring the first Banshee over here, kill off these two roaches, and force all the rest of them to run home. Uh, I think Zerg just recently overtook me in Harvesters just when he started mass droning. So I was ahead in economy for the first nine minutes, which is awesome. But remember, I'm ahead in economy, but I'm over I'm ahead in worker count, but I'm oversaturating one base here, and I'm only on three gas rather than four. So it's not as good as it should have been. It looks like I got one Overlord kill. Let's check out its path here. Sometimes they like to hide over these ridges, so I would check out that out. And then just kind of clearing that my area. Look, I can get an overlord, another overlord kill there. I get another overlord kill here. And this overlord, I think, is going to get forced home. It's not bad. I have three overlord kills and force the fourth one home. And it's nice to force them away. It just means that you're a little more likely to get your expansions later on if he doesn't have overlords everywhere spotting for it. Uh, it looks like I went Banshee second, so I finally smartened up and got rid of these roaches. So I can... 12 minutes into the game, only getting my fourth gas going. Well, maybe 13 minutes, because I'm not actually doing it. And I kill off those two roaches and head back. Come on, get that gas. There we go, finally. Um, I was trying to build tech labs with this factory to swap the start ports but I accidentally build a reactor. <laughs> uh, looks like I'm only going four start ports this match, which is okay. You can really only afford three start ports. The reason I get five is to spend up my big store of like 1600 gas. Um, but with only three gas I didn't I never got that big store. 
So I think four star ports is enough. And if you spin up that gas fast rather than slow, that gets your ravens out faster, which is nice. So you have more ravens available early. And then not only are they available early, but they're storing up gas for when you use them later. Or storing up energy for when you use them later. Building up energy. That would be the proper term. Uh, we'll go back to production tab. We'll get scared rid of this annoying name tag. So Raven's just starting. Keeping them in range of this third because I want to be able to defend it. Um, I'm not throwing down auto turrets yet because I don't think he knows about it. This Elnaga Tower cannot see this base. Um, but I did send over my fresh set of marines there. I sent over my banshee. So I have a little extra defense here and then I got my Ravens nearby. Uh, throw up these missile turrets in the high ground. Just because they, uh, they can defend from up there and be safe from Zerglings. And I'll probably have to eventually get some on the low ground. Blow away that SCV because it's kind of stuck there. If you have a stuck SCV and if you don't have available medevacs, you may as well just kill it because it's just wasting one of your supplies. Unless I know this is going to be an area that mutas are always going to attack, then I can use that SCV to auto repair the turret a little bit. <laughs> but that's never going to happen. So we got the income tab here. Zerg is ahead by 20 harvesters and up four bases to three, but that's obviously expected with this build. Um, he did build up, do a bunch of aggression early on, so that kind of kept him behind. And if I'm even 10 minutes into the game, even if I fall way behind afterwards, I still feel that I'm in really good shape. I just scout this base so he knows it exists. And I'm right at the point now where I've almost spent through my gas store. Seeing another command center. I could take my fourth. I decided just to fortify my third since I know he scouted it. And getting down these missile turrets now. Since all I've seen is roaches, I don't mind having these fortresses close together. <clears throat> you can put them even right beside each other. That way they protect each other from uh, roach attacks or broodlords or whatnot. Uh, but versus bailings, you want some gaps between them. And you typically want the one fortress out in front of the other one to pop bailings that are en route to this one. And the reason you don't want them together is because bailings can just hit the sweet spot between them and, and blow up both of them at once. So I'm still going aggressive with my ravens, and this is what I'm taking from my aggressive style. <coughs> Excuse me. I uh, did have spines over here, so I threw the uh, auto turrets on the, this side to kill the hatchery, but he responded really quickly. So I'm just going to get out of here. Looks like I'm going to try to seek or miss one of these... Uh, Infestors. Yeah, there you go. Nice. You get one shot Infestor with Synchro Missile, which is pretty cool. So notice I wasn't throwing down auto turrets at my third base. That's like a only if necessary sort of idea. Um, and that allows me to store up enough energy to go harassing at my typical time, which is like 16 minutes or so, 17 maybe. And immediately pulling back. Um, I don't want to get over aggressive with them. I still kind of want to do this passive style and build up a gigantic amount of ravens. The other thing from the passive style is I still like to do multiple fortresses, move out with my marines, and uh, multiple planetaries. Building three more planetaries to take my next base. I'll put at least two of them there. I'm not quite sure what I'll do with the third one, maybe up here. important to keep this door closed. Notice I do the double door thing just so there's no weak point in this wall. The only weak point in this wall is the supply depot and if you kill the supply depot you're not actually into the base yet. You still gotta kill another supply depot or a bunker. Uh, this was kind of nice. Looks like I killed off all his roaches so there's still two leftover auto turrets. Uh, not in range to kill anything but they are giving me a little bit of sight in that I feel I'm safe here because if his army was here he probably would kill these turrets. So I'm coming back for another attack. 
And this lane of attack is pretty safe. I mean, there is no man's land here, but it's really far away from the Zerg base. And then this Starfield Rock is super um, hamper system mobility. And I throw on all these auto turrets, get a nice spread on the way in in case of investors. Moving back this way, throwing on a scan just to kind of keep an eye on my own retreats. Anytime he knows where my ravens are, so if I pass over, say, his El Naga Tower, or if I'm just retreating from an attack, he knows where my ravens are. That's when you want to kind of lead your... Anytime you're walking through somewhere that could be dangerous, you want to lead that with a scan just to keep your eye out for investors waiting for me. And I didn't catch the investors, but I did catch the corruptors. Kind of micro fail here. I keep trying to do multiple seeker missiles, but um, I keep breaking that command by <laughs> telling my ravens to move. It's like, do the seeker missiles and then shift move. Not do the seeker missiles and move. <laughs> Gotta allow them to finish that uh, command first before I move. And let's see, he's gonna march some broodlords here and start putting some attack on my main base. Uh, I didn't know that actually, but these missiles turrets down just to give a little cover for the fourth base, but. Now I think I see it. Uh, looks like he threw some links in here. That's probably to free up supply. And uh, here's seeker missiles, so we should probably watch that. Oh my god, where'd all those corruptors go? Did I kill them all with Seekers? Oh, he's clustering them! Oh my god! <laughs> Seeker Missile is terrible versus uh, Corruptors. Just because Corruptors are 200 hit points, and they'll instantly regenerate one hit point, so even two Seeker Missiles dead on won't kill a Corruptor. You have to three-shot Corruptors. Broodlords are annoying in the same regard. They have 225 hit points. This one's almost dead, so I throw down an auto turret. Whenever you use auto turrets for broodlords, you have to manually focus fire the broodlord because auto turrets will fight broodlings by default. I have no idea what these SCVs are doing. Oh, I was transferring them. I probably just didn't have the wall open. Secreting my own ravens there, I think. And a little cluster of uh, Vikings to deal with that. You don't want to go too hard on the Vikings when there's infestors on the field. Just because, you know, a large viking clump will just get devastated by fungals and infested terrans. And it's a big waste of money. Inf Vikings are actually really expensive considering how fast they die, so... I guess for me, I only have to care about gas, but even gas-wise, were they 75? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's not cheap, gas-wise. Throwing down another command center here. Missile turrets here. This is another thing I've learned from facing Broodlords this passive style. Missile turrets always behind the fortresses. Um, the way Broodlords work is that uh, they'll attack whatever is high threat priority. So any structure that can attack, like bunkers, missile turret, fortress, and of course any army units. So if Broodlords were to attack this base right now, they would attack whatever is out front. So all the Broodlings would end up here. Uh, and that's what you want. You want the broodlings on your fortresses, because the fortress will pop them, and you can just put some SCVs on auto repair on the other side, and they'll keep it as stalemate. But if I had, say, a missile turret right here, the broodlings would attack that missile turret first, and there's no way I can keep that alive. Um, that would just die, and then they would move on to the fortress. So any missile turrets you have in front will always die. But the ones in the back will stay alive, and that's still good. I mean, obviously they won't kill broodlords. They'll never kill broodlords, but they'll, they'll give you cover versus corruptors. So I could have a handful of Vikings and start shooting the Broodlords, and if he comes at me with uh, Corruptors, I can just move back to these Missile Turrets. Same with the Ravens, keep the Ravens safe. So we'll continue. Bunch of Bailings morphing here, so it looks like he's going to try a Bailing Bust. And I do have these Fortresses close together, because I hadn't seen Bailings all match. I've seen everything but Bailings, so I didn't think you would switch to Bailings, but he is. Looks like I caught view on them, so I quickly tried to come over here to intercept. I wanted to pop them with the Seekers before they got in. But, yeah, mostly got around. I think it helped a little bit. Any bailing you blow up that's already in range of the command center is still going to kill the command center, so that's not good. But I think I popped some bailings right here, um, which probably saved my second fortress. And that's one of the nice things about multiple fortresses in a base, even if you... Uh, oh, let's get back to that in a second. It's like I'm moving out here. I do scan ahead and I see the investor, so I run away and I'm caught. And 
Now investors, um, I was talking about how bad seekers versus corruptors and versus broodlords just because of the amount of hit points they happen to have. You can't, it's not like a nice number for seeker missiles. And where infestors are fat, so you won't get good splash damage on them, like you, you're, you'll be lucky to hit four at once. Whereas with like muters or zerglings, you could hit like 20 or 30 at once. Hmm. So they're not good for splash damage, but they are really good for their in terms of their hit points. They have 90 hit points, which means you can one-shot them with a Seeker Missile. Or if they take like the 50 damage of the splash damage, it only takes two of those to kill an Infester. And that's what I've learned recently that actually, normally when I get fungal like this, I just throw down as many auto turrets as I could and try to flee away. But now I know that Seeker Missile is really good versus uh, Infesters. And when you're just trying to waste energy because you know they're going to die, you can waste energy faster with a Seeker Missile anyway, so it's probably better than Auto Turret for that reason too. So I just unload a bunch of Seeker Missiles and say goodbye to every single one of those uh, Infestors just because the math works out quite well for that. And I'm even able to flee. I left these, right, these uh, Vikings behind. You know what I don't like about Fungal? Is that it breaks any command you're doing. If it didn't break your command, I'd be much happier. Like, say I'm trying to flee back to my main base, and I, my unit gets caught in a fungal. I think when the fungal ends, it should go back to its previous command. Or it should never actually break the previous command. Like, it should still try to fly back. And those Vikings I have following my ravens, they should still be following my ravens, even if they get fungled. Obviously, they're held in spot for a moment, but um, once that's done, they should still do what they're told to do. Anyways, still 4 base on 5 base, um, still a 20 Harvester lead for the Zerg. Looks like he's been blowing up a bunch of my uh, workers, so he's killed 25 mine, I killed 14 of his. And looks like there's some more Corruptors out here, maybe to deal with Ravens, maybe to become more Broodlords, and it looks like another Bailing Bust is getting worked up on this side. I threw up a lead bunker just to kind of soak up some uh, Bailings, or kill off some Bailings. Because I did have to rebuild this command center here, and I don't like having two fortresses right next to each other when bailings are a threat. But I mean, I this one was the one that died. If this one died, I would build rebuild it further away. But this one died, and that's the only spot for it to go. Unless I want to distance mine, which I don't. Uh, I did put this reactor to use. I made some blue flame hellions and then threw the uh, factory on it, so now I can spend up money on blue flame hellions. I don't like spending a lot of money on marines with this build because my raven flock can get so big that I can supply cap and I don't want to be supply capped on, or maxed out on supply and I don't want to be maxed out on supply on uh, on marines. I want that supply to be spent on ravens. But hellions don't take a lot. You can make a harass squad for like 10 supply, 12 supply. It's so coming here. Check out this. I'm actually even hotkeying my army because I'm doing two things at once. So I have a uh, my Hellion set to two. Probably still do it terribly. And then um, one I got my uh, Raven, so. Hellions. Ravens. Hellions. You just double tap the number, you can go between them. Oh, we missed something. And we're on slow speed for some reason. So it looks like he moved in with these bailings. Yeah, so he wins. Yeah, he just went for SCVs. So all my fortresses lived. He got my bunker and all my SCVs, but uh, the base is still alive. And that's okay with this many fortresses. You can regenerate, rebuild uh, workers pretty fast. But at the same time, I'm killing a bunch of his workers. I mean, this base is getting destroyed, and this base got destroyed pretty well. Bring my Hellions back. But while I was microing that, I did get intercepted. So it's hard to show all this at once. And this is the no man's land I was talking about. Now this time I got caught in no man's land. It's one dead raven. Two, three, four, five, six. Maybe another one up here. I couldn't really tell. So at least seven, possibly eight or nine. I just lost there. 
So my raven count is back to 20. Always good to stuff your hellions in a place like this if you're getting chased by links. Don't stutter step move away, just run them somewhere to cluster the links into like here. So I don't know how many links are chasing me, say it was like 20. Obviously that would kill three hellions no matter what I do, but if I stuff them in here so all the uh, zerglings just dance around here like idiots, um, you'll be able to kill them all off. You can do that with marines too. You do like a drop of marines, just get all the... Uh, you know, say you're out here with marines and then zerglings come in, move your marines back over here and all the zerglings will cluster up here like idiots. Uh, this time I was aware of what was going on so I, I do notice he's intercepting my retreat. So I throw on a couple of seeker missiles and PDD. More or less keeping my raven numbers up. But this base is down and I even took out his gold. So now he's back to four base. He's lost a bunch of workers. So he's lost 69 workers now. But we got another Brewlord attack on my fourth. So this game is definitely not set in action. That's the problem with missile turrets. You can see any missile turret you have up front is going to be in trouble. And all the missile turrets I had in the back got killed by those bailings earlier. That's the other thing I killed, so this kind of sucks. It's fighting without uh, any missile turret cover. And again, Seeker Missiles are really bad versus Broodlords. It takes so many of them. It's such a huge sink of uh, resource or energy. And even losing some to uh, Corruptors because I don't have the cover fire here. Throw down PDDs here and there for cover, but you really want those missile turns. But this is more what you want to see. You got the fortress in the front, soaking up all the uh, broodling damage, and then you can still have these uh, missile turrets behind your safe. Ooh, a bunch more broodlords over here, too. So despite killing like seven broodlords, there's still uh, ten left. Focusing ones with high hit points, because ones with low hit points will just die to the slash damage. It's good to like, take a good look at the hit points and think of how to attack. Like, I actually go back to that and look at it one more time. Sorry if I'm doing a lot of um, rewinding here. But the idea is when I see this stuff, I'm like, well, if I attack this one here, and if I attack this one here, it'll do maximum damage to these two that have big hit points, and these two that have small hit points, they'll just die to the splash damage anyways. And now it's just two broodlings with low hit points, and it's going to throw auto turrets under them. Threw down another PDD to protect those ravens. And that clears out that set of brood lords, but there's still another six over here. Once it gets enough brood lords to, to get broodlings wrapping around your fortress, that's when your fortress will go down. Because when it wraps around, they won't be able to get the fortress, so they'll start killing the repairing SCVs, because SCVs are equal threat priority when they're repairing it. Um, more PDDs and obviously a handful of Vikings is good. And I'm realizing I can get actually more Vikings because I don't think he's re ever replenished his uh, Infestor count from when I Seeker Missiled all of them. Ooh, a little Miss Rally of Corruptors here. Throw away a bunch of them. And looks like I got a big mess of Hellions here. <laughs> uh, so coming in for a multi-pronged attack here, I got the Ravens coming in below with the uh, Viking cover. Got a bunch of Marines just going A, moving into his brunt of his base, and then harassing the side of his base with the... Uh, claim Hellions, and yeah, those Zerglings are not going to work. Fungal will work. Kinda. I didn't seem weak, but they have 90 hit points. So that's like, that's, that's okay. It's a lot better than Marines, anyway, especially these unupgraded ones only have 45. So they cleared those up, but I am coming in through here. Uh, this one's got an auto turret on it, auto turreting up that base, and just gonna go throw auto spread auto turrets all through his base here. 
go after his tech. Uh, what probably would have been smarter would be to spread them out all along this edge here, so I can kind of go up to the edge of his tech and shut down this mining base. But it doesn't matter. That's his GG. So that's kind of how I'm doing it now. I'm still trying to do the aggression with the Ravens. I'm still going to send them out on the early attack mission, say like 16 minutes, or basically whenever I spend up my pool of gas is when I send them out. Um, so even if it's far away, I'll take the risk uh, of flying through open air, or open space. Um, the whole idea with the passive style is when he spawns far away from me, I can kind of wait until we expand towards each other, use my ravens defensively, and then once we've expanded towards each other, like, you know, once, you know, he's taken this base and I've taken this base, so we're really close to each other, I can just kind of dart in, throw down a bunch of auto turrets, dart out, and be completely safe. But that just gives Zerg too much time and too much strength. So that was not panning out for me, so I'm still going to be aggressive with my ravens, but I'll take from the passive style what I liked. And what I liked was these uh, ex expanding with multiple command centers at once, bringing the Marines over, bringing over the Ravens in case I need auto turrets. In this case, a Banshee too. And then these multi-fortress bases, they work a lot better versus like, bail they can be bailing bombs as easily because usually one fortress is going to live. Um, Mass Roach doesn't work as well because now you have multiple fortresses doing all that splash damage. Um, broodlings don't work as well. Broodlords don't work as well because you'll have like multiple fortresses popping on the broodlings and you can still repair the fortress versus broodlords. And even ultras where they'll still completely clean up the space because they're ultralisks and that's what they do. Um, at least they'll take losses. <laughs> you know, usually if you send five... Uh, I would say six, say six ultras against one of these fortresses, you won't even end up with an ultra in the red. Um, but sending six against three fortresses, you'll probably end up, you'll kill everything, but you'll probably end up losing some ultras in the, in the process. Um, versus ultras, you still kind of want to wall off if you can. So maybe if, you know, if I had my two fortresses here. Maybe I'd still build some barracks along this way if I knew um, altars are on the way. Get some marines behind. Get plus one on the marines at least, just so they can do somewhat, some sort of damage to altars. <laughs> because their armor gets so high in altars that marines are pretty useless, so you gotta move your attack uh, higher as well. Really versus Ultralis, you want Ghosts for Snipe. You want a lot of Marauders or a lot of Tanks. Uh, and I can't get any of those things with my build. Maybe I could get a handful of Marauders, but that's... I don't know. That's something to think of, but without the high numbers, I still just feel like it's wasted gas. Maybe if I had them in bunkers, it would be better, but... A Marauder transition I've done in the past versus Ultras has gone very poorly for me, so I've, I've stopped trying that. Anyways, that's kind of where my build's at now. I'm, I'm more or less liking it. And I'm still learning new things because I'm having... The one thing I've been learning a lot over the last while is how to deal with Tier 3. Because Broodlords, used to, my only option used to be to base trade. Now I'm kind of getting a feel for... You know how to deal with them. You know I can use Seeker missile. I can get some Vikings even if he has infestors. I can get my missile turret set up in correct positions. I can keep my fortresses alive to, you know, to stall. Um, and I know you know don't put uh, missile turrets out front. Any Marines you have, throw them in the back again because you don't want them soaking up uh, Broodlord damage. In an ultra list, I'm learning that if you do this like solid wall off like this with lots of marines behind, you can actually kill some of them, maybe all of them before they can get in. Just little things like that. So I still feel like, despite having done this build like 500 times, it's still improving, which is pretty cool. If you do something this often, you can still find ways to make it better. Makes me happy. And it keeps things fresh, which is good. So, anyways, with that, we will call it the end of this video, and, uh, yeah, let's do a thumbs up fact this time. 
The Yamato is loaded. And so am I. Alright, for today's thumbs up fact of the day, I want to talk about this idea I came up with. And it all started with that uh, durable materials upgrade. The one that makes Raven spells last longer. And I've always been on the fence about it because Order. you can throw down an auto turret. And I got durable materials here. You can see it lasts a full four minutes. But without durable materials, it lasts three minutes. So I'm like, well, what? how much is that fourth minute actually going to help me? Because usually whatever I threw down an auto turret for, it served its purpose within the first three minutes. Either the auto turret's dead or it's killed whatever it's supposed to kill and there's nothing left to kill there. Obviously there's some defensive times or, or zoning times where you want turrets to last as long as possible, but that's basically my thought process for staying away from durable materials. Sometimes I guess, sometimes I don't. But I kind of forgot that we're, there's more than just the auto turret. It makes the PDD last longer. And most importantly, it makes the Seeker Missile last longer. And I've noticed this in a couple replays, especially the one versus um, Red 13, where I actually complimented him at is, uh, you know, you're pretty good at dodging uh, Seeker Missiles every time I launch them, you moved away. But then when I watched the replay, they still all landed because I had the durable materials. And people just kind of have like this internal clock in their head. They just know how long Seeker Missile lasts for. So I'm like, if I try to seek a missile, like if I got this uh, uh, Zergling here and I, and I cast Seeker Missile on it, he's like, oh, okay, I'll just flee and I'll just run like a screen or two away and I know I'm safe. And that's what he'll do, I'll just like, I'll come back here. And then he'll go on and do his injecting and do whatever, but this thing lasts forever now. <laughs> and he'll chase them all the way back and usually wherever they flee to, it'll land. Um, it actually adds 25% onto the duration time of Seeker Missiles from 15 seconds to 20. And that's what's going to lead me into this idea um, of how to extend the range of Seeker Missiles. Seeker Missile is range of 6. So let's talk about the scenario where, you know, say he's creep spread out to the middle of the map, and in the middle of the map, he, that's where he keeps his uh, links and bailings, you know, ready for a counterattack, maybe to come bailing bomb one of my bases. So what you could do is you could move your Raven way out there. Being low susceptible, and then, and then uh, oh, let's pick one with energy, though. And once we find the spot the ravens, or spot the units, we can cast a Seeker Missile on it and come out and kill them that way. Now, obviously, that leaves you susceptible to getting this raven picked off. Um, also, you know, this stuff is pretty fast, especially on creep. So if he sees a raven coming, he'll probably suspect a, a Seeker Missile, so he'll probably flee away. And having to get within six range before you even fire, then it, you know, there's a slow animation of the thing popping out. Um, that means your raven's getting really close, can be picked off, and again, the slow animation just gives them more time to flee. So this is how to extend the range of Seeker Missile from six range to whatever you want. We'll say 106 range, you know? And the way we're going to do this, you know, I got my early Viking. I, I'm probably going to try this in a match. Where I'm kind of you know going around trying to kill overlords and then say I, I find his his pack of stuff. That's what I do when you got durable materials and seeker missile. Seeker missile, your own Viking. Agreed. And then just run the Viking over where you want. So I'm just going to put this in the pack here. And kaboom! I've just extended the range of Seeker Missile basically indefinitely as far as it can fly for 20 seconds. And you can even come back and heal up. Yes, indeed. Uh, if you don't care about healing up, you can actually do multiple Seeker Missiles too. It doesn't matter if your Viking dies. I mean, you can put like as many Seeker Missiles on it as you want. Right away. No one lives forever. Very well. Because <laughs> uh, they still blow up. Like even though the first two seeker missiles killed the the Viking, the rest of the seeker missiles will still blow up at the same place where the Viking was. Obviously, you don't want to use like twelve seeker missiles. What I did there, I just wanted to show the fact that you can use multiple seeker missiles. And you can do it on whatever you want. You want to do it on a 
Helene might make it a little easier. It's probably harder to get the splash damage because this is a ground unit as well, but uh, um, but at least the Helene moves fast, so you don't have to worry about killing yourself. Order acknowledged. Order accepted. And that's my idea. I'm not sure if it's unique or not. It seems like it's something someone would have come up with before. Cause it's now that I'm actually saying it, it seems pretty obvious. But I never thought of it until now. And the way I do my build, I typically have a leftover Viking, and I typically, I think now anyways, I'm going to be getting durable materials more often since I'm playing more passively. I'll be using the uh, turrets defensively, and then also since I've learned that it kind of helps seeker missile a lot, and I'm using more seeker missiles these days. Um, yeah, I mean, early Seeker Missile upgrade and early Durable Materials would definitely be in my repertoire. So I'd say, you know, at the probably 11 minute mark, I'll be ready to do this little trick. <laughs> and it could prevent uh, some, sometimes Zerk just likes to stay Tier 2 or Tier 1 and just Bailing Bomb me rather than uh, attacking towards tier 3 quickly. Normally I don't have much issue with that just because they waste so much resources on killing all my killing my bases with like 30, 30 bailings every time as well as my harass killing them but uh, this would be a nice way to kind of intercept that idea you know you see a bunch of uh, bailings spawning up front and you can go blow up like 12 of them with a seeker missile. So with that, we will call at the end of this thumbs up fact and the end of this video. So yeah, thank you everyone and hit that subscribe button. I do four to five videos a week of Master League Terran ladder matches and uh, lots of commentary and whatnot. And uh, hit that favorite and thumbs up and goodbye.